Oh, goodness. No, just, so just official test. now. Just yeah. testing it out. I've never. Uh, yeah, believed. that's. It's relatively new that it does that now and gives you that little. The, the reading is entitled, Yes, There's No Binary. Mm. The road not taken is not a fork. That's too simple a thought, flipping some coin, either or. Nope, it's not this or that. No or yes, it's nor, neither, and all of the above and more. The road taken goes every way at once. There, there, they, them, go. Go now and live. Lovely, thank you. So I met Mary Bean many years ago in Toronto, briefly, then she moved out to the country. And then she moved to Vancouver, where we see a lot of each other on the GSA, but also circle dancing and in the Earth Spirit session and on Sunday mornings and all over the place. And we have fun with saying we're Mary, Mary Meet and Mary Part, Mary Meet Again. And I've seen a couple of Mary's plays, very happy to see them both when I've had a chance to see them in development and in, in final form and enjoyed watching this very much and uh, was there for the talk back that was after the screening earlier in the year. And uh, look forward to meeting the um, cast more and hearing more about the play and how it impacted people. I'll pass it along to Mary Beam to introduce people and go from there. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, yes, so I'm the playwright for the play, and um, Neela is uh, one of the actors. She she plays Lucy. They play Lucy. <laughs> um, I got to deal with Neela that she's going to call. They are going to call me in anytime I misgender. So um, as you can see, Neela uses they them pronouns and I do my best to use them. Um, so uh, Neela not only plays the role of Lucy, but she was instrumental in um, getting they this play. Were. They were instrumental in getting this play written. So they were talking to me about um, that they would love to see a play where the character was our age and, and also non-binary and at first I couldn't quite think of how I could do that what would the conflict be how would you know what were the characters but then it came together for me in um I wrote this play in May and June of 20 so what's that last year just last year yeah at the start of the of the um, pandemic so um so it was clear to me right from the start that that Neela would um play the role of Lucy and that role of Lucy is lightly patterned on both Neela and myself um, and some of the events that were happening in, in our household at that time. So uh, Neela plays the role of Lucy. Rebecca is the director. So we were very fortunate to have Rebecca come in and direct it. And uh, Tina plays the role of Carmel. And uh, Joel um, is the, uh, what's the word? He is Haven Theater. <laughs> so he produced the play. Um, we're very grateful to have a platform to, to show the play. Because one thing is writing it. Another thing is getting out there to have people see it. Mm -hmm. So, so um, if each of you would like to say a few words, that would be great. We'll start with Neela. Uh. <laughs> I get to go first because I called you in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I just want to say how happy I am to, to act in anything that Mary wrote. Uh, I've acted in a few of her other plays and it's just great. Uh, I love her writing. I like, I love their writing. See, I, uh, I, yes. I do it too. 
Um, and I, I was very happy to have uh, Rebecca come and, and direct and, and Joel, I mean, we wouldn't be doing this at all if it hadn't been for Joel and Haven Theater. So thank you, Joel. Um, and Tina and Bonnie were great tagged with very good scene partners. So uh, I, I don't have a lot to say. I, I'm just happy to respond to any comments or questions. Okay, so maybe we'll keep going around, let each of the cast and crew have a word and then we can open it up for questions. So um, I think if you want, you could put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Is that right, Mary? Sure. Yeah. Okay, Rebecca. Sure. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so as Mary uh, and Neela said, I came on board as the director for the production that you saw. Um, Neela brought me on board. We had worked together previously on a show a number of years ago. Um, so I was thrilled uh, to be able to have the opportunity to work with them again. And maybe I'll, I'll just speak to a, a couple of the things that um, struck me about the piece when I first read it. So Neela sent me the script to have a look at, and then I uh, chatted with Neela about it and chatted with Mary about it before we started auditions and rehearsals. Um, and I think first of all, which perhaps is very clear that that the piece um, gives representation to voices that we don't, I was gonna say don't always hear in the theater, but I'll say that I've never heard in the theater. <laughs> so um, I think that was something Neil and I talked about when we first met, I said, I've, I'm starting to see non-binary characters uh, that are you know, in their teens, in their 20s, um, but certainly not um, a portrayal of older characters, um, which I which I think as soon as I read the play, which I think Joel would echo this as well, it was like this, yeah, this, this production needs to be seen. Uh, and I really loved how it explored how we understand and, and build identity through relationships, I think was one of the biggest things uh, for me. And when we have kind of everything that's happening between Carmel and Lucy, um, you know, and how they've built certain parts of their identities, Carmel specifically, um, in relation to 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 relationships and to other people. Um, yeah, I think maybe that's those are the <laughs> most things that I want, want to share. I uh, was really grateful to be part of the process, and I think for me. Um, especially coming into the process as someone who is cisgender, meaning I identify with the gender that corresponds with my sex at birth. So I identify as female and that was my sex assigned at birth. Um, that I was constantly trying to, you know, check some of my assumptions in terms of what I was thinking about, how the characters were maybe thinking about something. And I'm sure I could have done better <laughs> every single day of the rehearsal process so just but very grateful to be in those positions where where you're you're um being challenged to kind of confront that or maybe what what you're making assumptions about or what you know or don't know so feel very grateful to be be part of the process and to have learned from everyone in the room as we as we went through everything so now maybe stop talking and pass it back there <laughs> thanks for that it's always great to hear, hear from you. And uh, shall we go, Tina, next on my screen? Okay, um, I think Neela is the one who sent me the script, or maybe it was you, Mary. No, it was you, right? Did yeah. you send me the script like yeah. last summer or something? Yeah, it was an earlier version, not the one that we performed. It was slightly different in places. Um, and I've performed in Mary's, uh, some of Mary's plays before. So I was like, yes, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, and then uh, they said that Neela was going to be in it. And I don't know, I think, I think, yeah, I think then I talked to Neela. And then Rebecca came on board. And yeah, <laughs> so I was in. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Okay, and just when I'm going to call on Joel, he disappears. Oh, he knew that. He, he knew he was. <laughs> 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 oh, 
acting like Betty's just disappeared. Joel, are you coming screen. back? Joel, Joel. You're Joel. being called. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Joel. Are you able to talk now? Yes, I just want to quickly plug my, before I disappear completely, my battery was really low. Uh, okay, yes. There I am. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, uh, now I lost all my train of thought and everybody else has said all the things that I probably wanted to say, but uh, I think this kind of started when I was talking with Neela and we were looking at what kind of stories we wanted to tell with Haven. Mm -hmm. And we had already worked on a few together. And Neela introduced me to Mary and Mary sent over this script, uh, which I don't think had ever been performed before. And uh, I just was wanting to read it. And uh, uh, it really, uh, it was kind of my introduction to a lot of these themes and I was immediately struck by how uh, immediate it was and it had this kind of fly on the wall aspect that I felt like we were listening to conversations that were really meant to be private between these people mm -hmm. and I was really impressed by or struck by the fact that these, this was a story I hadn't yet seen told on the stage before uh, with ages that uh, are not maybe are neglected when it comes, especially to stories about relationships and, uh, and gender. Um, so it was, it was very eye-opening and I immediately knew that I wanted to be involved in, in whatever way that I could to help bring this uh, story. And I think uh, from there, we just continued to, uh, to talk and uh, it went from an idea to actually happening. And uh, I was just blown away by, uh, Rebecca's direction and uh, how she used Mary's wonderful script to bring to bring this to life. So it was so far probably Haven's proudest achievement, and I'm so so thrilled that it's uh, continuing to to share its message. Ooh, sorry, <laughs> that's that's me. Thank you, Joel. Very so great. Mary Beam, I, if the everybody's spoken, I think Eva can make my poll appear. Eva, can you make it so? <laughs> you're, you're muted, Eva. Yeah, Mary, I'm not quite sure what to do. I, I signed out and I signed back in. Uh, I, I, I can launch it. OK. Right. There we go. Does everybody see the poll? Yeah. Okay. So are you good now, Mary, with the poll for you? It, it seems so. I, I don't know how I got to be able to, but I looked and there it was. All right. right. Is it only the church members who are allowed to do this? Or no, can anybody we want else? everybody. Everybody fill it out, please. Okay. Oh. Ooh. Now. Uh, I, I can't submit. I've I've filled out all the checks, but it won't let me submit. There's more to the poll. You have to scroll down. I only saw the first one, and then it just has disappeared on me. Yes, mine too. Yeah. There's three questions. Um, okay. It disappeared. It's not no longer on the screen. Or did you want the? Oh, here it comes back. Did you want the actors to do it too? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It's a little experiment. There's three How do you oh, It's not letting me submit. Maybe uh, do you do fill out all three questions? Maybe you need to. It was oh, sorry, I see. So thank you. Yep. Hey again. Disappeared. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll relaunch it. Um, I'm not quite sure why. Um, Oh, well, now we have to start over again? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I don't know how to make it a longer. It's, it's a speed test. Yeah. <laughs> no. Sorry. Now, if I, I catch it, it's going to If I Pressure. catch it, it's going to disappear. How do I get the next? Um... We could let this go. 
okay, I, I'm getting results now. So some people okay. are doing it. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in about 60 <laughs> seconds, I would say hit show results. Okay. And we'll share whatever's there. I, I only saw the first question. Scroll well, down. I, I couldn't, every time I touched it, it disappeared. It might uh, be different on an iPad. I don't know how to do a poll on an iPad. Oh, maybe. There we go. All right. Woohoo! I submitted. <laughs> okay, I've got 12 of 15. Oh, good. And I don't seem to have access to it because I'm the host. Disappeared again. I'm too slow. Here it is. I think okay. the reason I can't have access, Mary, is because I'm a co-host. I guess that's why. Because yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is what we've got. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people not familiar with the term of NB, which I had to have explained to me just a couple of um, days ago. Sorry, so what's the difference between the red and the and the blue lines? I, th I think it's just showing which are the, the most, which have the most responses or, yeah. Okay. So the, the three red I ones are there. answers to your question. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. So should we, does anybody want to talk about what NB means? Non-binary is what it stands for. Yeah. It's letters N and B. Yeah. Um, and sorry. And a a gender. Sorry. Is that my your clock? clock? That's my clock. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Does anybody want to talk about a gender? I don't know what it is. Yes, I like I like to hear. Yeah, about it. A gen yeah. a gender is a sexual orientation. Mm. It, people can correct me if I'm wrong, but it means that the person is not attracted to um, either males or females or any other identified group. Um, <laughs> although there are some variations on that. So for some, it may be that occasionally they are, are attracted under certain conditions. But in general, they're not. Yeah. Neela, do you want I think to Neela, add? I think Sorry, Neela Mary. Yep. Sorry, Mary. I, I, I disagree a bit. Um, I think that a gender has to do with gender and, and gender identity and not um, sexual orientation. Um, a, a gender means a person. I, I identify as a gender, personally, Neela. <laughs> and uh, it mean, for me, it means that I don't identify as a woman or as a man. And it, it's almost, it's a term that my doctor uses. When I explained to my doctor how I felt that I didn't feel like a woman, I didn't feel like a man, I didn't feel like I was anywhere on the gender spectrum. My doctor said to me, oh, well, you're agendered then probably. Is that the same as non-binary or is wouldn't that be sort of the same? I would say it's a kind of no, a subsection of non-binary. Oh, okay. I just Googled it and put it in the chat. I don't, I don't know how correct Google is. Yep. But this was helpful to me. Thank you. I, I was worried about that as well. Yeah, yes. And what Mary Beam was talking about is usually asexual. Right. People Sorry. also use the term aromantic, kind of. Oh. I'm into oh, sex and gender, but not romance. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Thank you. That's, I stand corrected. I was just looking at something of that um, the other day and reading about a gender um, and how sometimes it's shortened to ace. So if oh, you yes. see mm -hmm. that um, term right. of ace, then... Uh, it's usually asexual. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there another poll there? Um, okay. Google says there are 76 genders. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... Um, In what huh? society is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. So there's all kinds of um, polls. They all seem to be linked. Uh -huh. 
So can you see this one now? I see the results. Do you see this one? Do you know no. why some people prefer the pronouns? Do you see that? Can you scroll down and see it? Oh, no. oh I see it now. Yes, you can you have you can you have to manipulate it in your own self manually. Yeah. So it, people are pretty clear why people use the pronouns say them. Um, how many colors in the pride rainbow? <laughs> rainbow. Mary says six. six. They didn't have any indigo fabric, so they made a rainbow flag with six. Okay. Ah. But I would say I would say now that we have the progressive flag that oh. includes the BIPOC colors, I wouldn't limit it to six. Okay, there you go. Okay. Yeah. And um, do people know about this? Can you mm -hmm. see? Whoops, putting it the wrong way. Let me take it off and then I can. No, no. Do you know what that stands for? Oh, the trans flag. Is that trans? Yeah, yeah transgender. Yeah, yeah. That's I, think trans too, I think too that's on the latest pride flag as well as uh, yeah. the mm -hmm. symbol for intersex, which is a oh. circle on a yellow background. Yeah. Oh, okay. I haven't seen that I haven't, one. I haven't seen that. So <laughs> Neela, Neela, yeah. since you mentioned intersex, can you can you clarify then is intersex like a, a more just a biological term as opposed to having to do with gender or um, I've just wondered, or I just wondered if it was a medicalized term from the past, if we don't use it anymore or. I think it's still used and I think, I, I'm not sure, but I think that it is a medical term. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's about, uh, it's a person that has physical characteristics of both sexes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen documentaries about intersex people and that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're born with both male and female uh, physical characteristics, yes. Yes. Eugen Eugene Eugen Eugenides has a beautifully written book yeah. about, called Intersex. Yes, I read that. Yeah. So Deborah, you have your hand up, is that? That was my other question from before, so I'll put my hand down now. That was my comment, Eugenides' book on intersex. Fiction. Mm -hmm. Well, no, the reason the intersex symbol came up again is because of our ongoing bathroom sign issues. <laughs> <laughs> we wondered just how inclusive we could be on one little sign. <laughs> But uh, we managed. Well, I don't think we're quite done, Mary. I'm sorry to say, but who knows? <laughs> the little the little hearts are very small. That so are going Nan, Nan Gregory has her hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to know, would that be what was called a hermaphrodite? I think so. Probably. Okay. Yeah. Hermaphrodite <laughs> is the old term and intersex <laughs> is, is the new word for it. Okay, thanks. Jeanette so, Barker's put something into the chat about it too. Great. So one of the question was, do you know someone who prefers the pronoun they? And so 75% said yes. And so <laughs> got a couple here. Um, right the difference between sexual orientation and gender expression. So I think we're clear on that. And how comfortable are you using the pronouns say them for an individual? So if you could see, if you scroll down, you could see the results there. Easy peasy 42%. I often make a mistake and feel embarrassed. That would be me, <laughs> even though it's what I prefer. It feels awkward. Yes, I still have problems with they, them as a singular 25%. Uh, Mary, excuse me, but I don't get that poll. I've had the first one, but I don't seem to be able to access the other one. Yeah, I, I think if you, sc if you scroll right. down, you can see them. Um, I could relaunch, but it would wipe everything off. 
So I don't think we can do it. It's turned out to be in a good conversation and that's the main point. Yeah, yeah. I have to say for myself, um, I don't insist that people use the they, them, but when they do, I'm thrilled. I just can't help it. As soon as somebody refers to me as, as they, I'm like, oh, yes. So. <laughs> I, I can relate to that. And uh, for myself, I'd like to add that when someone refers to me, me as a she or as a lady or a girl, um, I, I feel like a little piece of my soul is shaved off, is broken off. It, it, I, it, more and more these days, it, it really affects me. Thank you for sharing, Neva. That's why we do our best. And you're pretty forgiving when we mess up. So I appreciate that. Oh, well, but as, I, as long as people try, like, you know, as long as it's, it's, it's uh, the people that don't appear to give a damn that really hurt. Or perhaps worse, the people who are violently opposed to it without understanding it. Yeah. Well, they're threatened by it. What, what did people think about the ending of the play? Were you happy with how the play ended or would you have preferred a different ending? I wanted a happy ending. It felt sad to me. I wanted a happy ending too, but I give you realistic points for realism. And I really liked the ending, Mary, and I felt like it, it might be happy one day down the road, but that there was no growth and people needed to evolve a little bit. And but that, I, I felt there was a glimmer of hope, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for as disappointed as I was that it wasn't a Hollywood happy ending, I, I agree that it left, it was realistic and it left room open for relationship to continue to happen. And that did feel good. It, it didn't feel like an end. It felt like the beginning of a process together. I, I really like the ambiguity of it. And I'm hoping that it means that there'll be a series. Oh. <laughs> I really liked the ending. Um, I thought it it kept it it kept it alive in my mind. The everybody's dilemma, everybody's dilemma in the play. And when I imagined, oh, if I was an actor, I could play every part, because the play made everyone so real, and I felt so sad for for um, everybody in the play because of the lives they were leading and the difficulty of their lives and how they were struggling and how they were messing up with each other and, and not listening or not speaking clearly or inopportunely or whatever. And so I, I, for me, the whole play just bubbled with that kind of, oh my gosh, it's so human. And the, the ending was yeah, it was it was sad, but I I it left me wondering what would happen. So I, I think it was very rich. It added to the richness of the play. Yeah, I, I like the ending too, although it's sort of um, uh, unfinished, right? It's unfinished, uh, but at the same time, it just um, in a way I know it's uh, open to any possibilities because any couple when they arrive at this kind of situation, they, they might work, work, they might go, f the next steps can be all different depending on so many factors. So it's just, uh, yeah, just leave it open and also allow the possibilities. You know, it's not like, oh, this is, this happened. So yeah, just, yeah, give the freedom to for each couple who may go through similar situation to to uh, to work things, you know, to go forward in their own ways. Yeah. 
Tina as, as Carmel. How did the ending feel to you? I'm trying to remember. I think when I first read the script, it was yes. the same ending, right? It was always that ending? Yeah. Neil, are you having trouble hearing me? Am I too quiet? I, I was having trouble at first. You were breaking up. Oh, OK. Um, or, or maybe it's my computer. Uh, well, my internet has been wonky, but um, yeah, I think I may, I may have cried when I read the script to myself first and got to the end and went, no, they break up. <laughs> believe at one of the rehearsals, uh, Rebecca asked us, what do we think happens next? What happens after the play is finished? Um, and we both, Neil and I both agreed that uh, eventually they would sort of maybe not come back as lovers, but they would still be friends. Like uh, Lucy says, you know, yes, I'll call you after a while. So it's not done, but yeah, it's done for now, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, but I, I really, that it moved me so much. I was, yeah, I was like, no. <laughs> my, my take on it was that that was the only kind of progressive uh, ending that there could be. That, uh, yeah, that Lucy had been honest with her situation, had tried. And there was no way she could uh, not continue on that path without kind of capitulating to, um, I forget the name you had, Tina. Oh, Carmel. To Carmel. And Carmel, as, uh, as um, Lucy pointed out, seemed to be more concerned about uh, being a, afraid of being alone than she was about what was best for each of them in terms of their growth. So to me, it seemed like the only, uh, progressive uh, ending that there could be. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was gonna ask Rebecca, but she's disappeared. Hey, you? Oh, oh, there you are, you? Rebecca. <laughs> About the ending? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think that I, I was really struck by, and now I haven't seen the script in a while, but so someone tell me if I'm really woefully paraphrasing, um, but the line when Lucy says, um, I, I love you, but it's not enough. Is that, yeah, okay. at, near the end? Yeah, that stood out to me uh, immediately, but as, a really powerful moment for Lucy. Like, I think the end for me though, of course, of course, sad and unfortunate, I think at least my kind of initial read of it. And I think I, I still kind of feel this way that, that I just was like, I was so um, like happy for Lucy that, that Lucy had had decided, you know, to do what was best for them at the end. And that line really struck me as like uh, such a strong line to be to be able to say that for someone and say that to someone and own the complexity of that feeling of like, yes, I love you, but you know, that's it's not enough right now. And I actually need, you know, need this space or I'm not getting everything that I need from you. So I and of course it's, you know, I think still difficult for Lucy, but I certainly found that to be a, a strong, like a, a, just a really strong choice for that character and, and feels very positive for that character to be take, taking what, what they need in terms of time and space. I don't know if that's how it felt for you, Neela, but. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Oh. I, I think it would have been very unrealistic for it to have a, and they all lived happily ever after um, ending. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that would have been sad. Like it would have felt really sad to me if it felt like in some way Lucy was compromising or or felt that they had to just, yeah. you know, sweep it under the rug or or 
you know, felt that they had to move forward in the relationship, not feeling like they were being seen um, fully. So I think that that would have made me more, more sad, I think, if that were kind of the, the outcome and it did didn't feel like things had resolved if if kind of if the, if Carmel's journey had been the same, but then they ended up together at the end, it would have felt. Yeah, but but I think it was uh, felt good for me that that I I as Lucy didn't close all doors, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, just well, yeah. I need some time give me some. Mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, re I remember feeling pathetically grateful. But Lucy, you know, was agreeing to like call me later. And I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll take anything at this point. <laughs> oh, poor Dina. <laughs> so, Leslie. Uh, thanks. I, um, in part, I suppose how you feel about the ending might depend on what you go to theater for. And I often go to theater to escape, not to relive the bloody reality that's so constant every day. But having said that, the way in which an ending could have been happier, I agree you don't want Lucy to compromise or step backwards or confine herself again. But if Carmel had chosen to be braver, then a happier ending might have emerged from that. You know, her her moment of saying, I don't want you to go away because I'm old and what if I get COVID or however it was, she said, you know, what if I need someone and you're not there? Yeah. Um, <laughs> isn't really isn't really relationship sustaining in a big way or in a positive way. So she would have had to be different for the ending to have been a happy one. But I wouldn't have minded a happy ending, I must say, Mary. <laughs> But Leslie, thanks for that sharing that. But I have to say, I enjoyed so much of the humor in the play up until when, you know, it, it wasn't, uh, it took its turns, but I really appreciated how much humor you put in there. So thank you. Um, it was fun to play that. Yeah. Nan has her hand up. Yeah, thanks, uh, Reverend Laura. I, um, okay, so this is about the ending. Um, Carmel, um, and if I'm remembering this completely wrong, you let me know, but Carmel shouldn't ought to have made that ultimatum. Like you have to take, um, Lucy has to take the, the thing off the dating site. Yes. Or this is the end of it. That was a big tactical error. That's the other thing is, not very bright. <laughs> and well, I mean, you know, stuff comes out and, and, and the other thing is Lucy, it, like you gave a crap, oh, sorry. Lucy gave a crap um, uh, apology for not telling her first. Like it was a horrible thing for her to find out from her friends. And Lucy says, yeah. well, I, didn't, I didn't tell you because I knew that you'd make a fuss about it. I mean, it, that wasn't very nice. Like the whole thing was escalating into uh, the most a horribly sad ending. It was really sad, but really. Yeah, did something funny that point. way. Yeah, I agree. We're, my, we were both yeah, equally to blame, right? You know, it was like, uh, yeah, both of us did like stupid things. Yeah, I, I agree. It, I agree, my apology was pathetic. <laughs> But we have to blame all this on Mary B, not on Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I speak as Lucy at the moment. <laughs> okay. so that, that's part of the genius of the writing. Yeah, and Diane Brown has her hand up. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to, I agree, I, I'm enjoying all these comments. I wanted to lift up Deborah Sutherland's comment about the humor. I so appreciated the humor. And I have to say, just so totally refreshing to see older people in theater who aren't white men. Um, uh, you know, I, as a as a theater professional, I get so sick of what's you know the mainstream fare, and uh, really refreshing to have these three dimensional characters. They're they're older. They have this this certain kind of wisdom that not that is not mainstream, 
And uh, it was just lovely to, to be a part of that world. And, and the intimacy of the play, mm -hmm. I think, really was enhanced, actually, by Zoom as a platform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, well, I guess it wasn't Zoom, it was YouTube, but you know what I mean. I felt like that really actually enhanced it. It became a little bit like mm -hmm. a film. We were really... Oh, yeah. Um, and that just was enthralling to me. So thank you. I just wanted to lift that up a bit. Thank you. Yeah, Joel, do you want to say anything about producing the play? Oh, I was thinking about everything people were talking about the ending and uh, yeah, the ending is, is what I got the most reaction about when I heard uh, feedback, everyone saying, oh no, why, why didn't they end up together? And, you know, uh, but I always felt that there was, there was a certain destructive element to the relationship that we could just kept building throughout the story. And even as I was reading it, I, I was like, I, I don't see how this is going to untangle itself in a way that's, you know, not going to have me reaching for the tissues at the end. So uh, it was the ending I think the play deserved and uh, it keeps, it's what sticks I think in a lot of people's minds. Uh, but you were, you mentioned something about producing it? Yeah. So in this limited time of, of not being able to, to get together in one room, it, it does open up in other ways, some possibilities, like in this situation where we were able to work with someone in Vancouver, most of the people in Toronto, I'm up in Aurelia, and we were able to fashion this story together through Zoom and uh, through Mary's writing. Uh, I would very much love to see this play come to life on stage in front of an audience where it can keep generating more conversations. Uh, the It did work very, very well as a Zoom show, as someone else said, where it brings you right into the story. But I think also being able to step back and and be able to see it unfold on a, on a stage in those real life uh, uh, settings that that let you disappear completely into into this story is is the next hopefully the next step. Leslie, you have your hand up. I do. Thank you. I I spent my first fifteen years at Aurelia Joel. It's nice to know that you're there now. Um, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to uh, say how much I enjoyed the character of the of the guest the third person. She's not here tonight, but a lot of the humor I really found was around her. It was just so enjoyable to have her there with warring hosts, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, Bonnie, Bonnie has, is really good as a comic actor. Yes. And she's another out of, out of towner. Uh, was she in Peterborough? Where is she? Uh, Barry. Barry. Mm. Barry. So we're all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Nancy? Yeah, I, I might have sounded a bit flippant when I said I'd like to see a serial, but I really fell in love with all the characters and I, I want to, I'm not ready to say goodbye to them yet. So, um, so it would be wonderful to see it again in whatever form, even if it's the, if it's the same old story, because I haven't, I'm, I'm feeling some separation anxiety. <laughs> I just want to pop in here and say uh, kudos to you, Mary, for I think it's just brilliant the way you put the setting in the early COVID uh, because it just forced people into this situation of this whole other added element of um, pressure and confusion and to have to face all of these other um, changes and um, communication in that setting I thought was just brilliant and uh, the whole thing was just so great. Yeah, just a brilliant play. Um, this may be stupid, but I, I want to mention that the, one of the things Rebecca wanted to have us do was uh, to pass stuff in and out of frame and Ooh. like the gloves and coffee cups and uh, you know a drink or whatever. And you would believe how much coordination that took to uh, to you know to have uh, Lucy pass something out and and uh, Martina receive it and stuff like that and you know the gloves the list 
<laughs> shopping coffee. the coffee yeah it's like here have my coffee you know and uh a, 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 an hour kiss <laughs> you yeah. know you kiss yeah <laughs> yeah it was a kiss <laughs> Stand up. You, you can't see your screen, right? So it's like one, two, three, breathe, sit down. <laughs> yeah. It's technique here. One one thing that worked really well, I thought, was um, there was a time when I guess Martina was a around, but Lucy and Carmel wanted to speak to each other and not to have her. And so they leaned in to talk. And yes. yeah. that's that really um yeah. Well, yeah, we're having a private conversation. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to see it on stage and see how, you know, it'd be different, quite mm -hmm. different to do it on stage. Yeah. Yeah, because if Martina's like on one side of the stage, like in another room, and then we're somewhere else, yeah. Hmm. Karen? Yeah, um, I'd like to open up the discussion just a teensy bit. Uh, wider um, and to uh, address all of you, playwright and actors equally. But do you see that um, that there that this is the start of maybe where other um, movements have been in the past of being able to play um, characters that are this uh, true to life? Um, so I, if you know, I would love to hear your comments on that, of, of being able to either write uh, a story that is um, so honest and for the, uh, for the uh, actors to comment on what it's like to act in a way that, um, you know, maybe this is the, the start of something, uh, you know, really great in theater. So over to you guys. Well, I can say that this play is probably took more from my life than any other play that I've written. Um, so we did, Martha and I did have somebody come and stay with us, came on the last train out of Toronto and they did end up um, having all of their plans canceled um, because of COVID. So now it was, he didn't stay with us that long. It, it was a man, he didn't stay with us that long, but it kind of, you know, so I was taking things from, from my life. So um, yeah, it's something I kind of haven't done before. So it may be, maybe the start of something. I don't know. You'll but, notice we're still together though. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> Dila, you were, instrumental well, in I, I this isn't quite an answer but I'd like to say first that um, for me it was very very meaningful to play a character that was non-binary as I personally am and a, a character that in, in their 70s as I personally am um, so that that was the very very meaningful and, and affirming and and exhilarating for me. In terms of it being a beginning of something, I don't know. Personally, I am somewhat discouraged, not from this play, of course, but but uh, in other theater center, cent, uh, theater um, places where where I have been acting and stuff, I I've been really discouraged with the lack of material um, that's relevant to my life. I hope it changes. I'll weigh in on that. Um, I think that a lot of the independent companies uh, have been doing progressive work for a number of years and are, are digging even deeper into that. Progressive, you know, meaning putting the underrepresented front and center and not just, you know, white, heterosexuals between the ages of 25 and 35. So for my own self, I know that I've dedicated my life to, <laughs> to doing theater that is not what you see at the arts club. Not that there's, you know, that's fine if you like the arts clubs, I'm not trying to bash them, but the mainstream theater does not represent the, what, you know, Canada is, 
arts club does not represent what Vancouver is. And it's time, it's high time for the mainstream houses to change that. Mm -hmm. the, the independents have been doing it for, for ages, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's why I was so happy to find Haven. Haven Theater. Yes. So, so Rebecca and Tina, do you want to respond to Karen's question before we go on to Cynthia? Uh, the question was, do you think it's something like the start of a new trend or? I can't um, Yeah, um, I, I'm actually riffing on what uh, Diane just said is that it, we don't see this kind of play on mm. the arts club, right? Um, and and so it was actually, but what I was actually asking is the, um, how did it feel personally for you as an actor to be able to work with this material? I think is what I'm asking. Oh, okay. Well, I, I love Mary Beam's plays. So um, that was, you know, a given. And because uh, I find that Mary's um, dialogue takes me to places like I don't have to do any work. It's just like the dialogue makes it happen. Um, and Neela and, and this play in particular, Neela and I worked so well together, I thought um, that, you know, I, our favorite thing, I think we had a couple scenes where we have, well, we have several scenes where we fight and those are all my favorites. <laughs> I love fighting. I, I think I said at one rehearsal, Rebecca, it's like, I love fighting with Neela. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> yeah, because those were the fun ones. <laughs> Cynthia yeah. has her hand up. Yeah. Um, Rebecca. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I think what I'm um, thinking to ask is related to what Car Carol was saying. Uh, like today, like uh, just on, on the uh, camera, uh, Joel is the only male, I mean, traditionally <laughs> male. And uh, so, uh, so it's, it's just like, um, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, it's not, you know, it's so it's not so not mainstream, right? It's it's so um, narrow uh, the the uh, the audience. So um, if you want to have an, an uh, hopefully to develop a new trend, uh, it would take a lot, right? It, because theater needs to survive. You need to have. You need to have uh, some kind of uh, revenue by the tickets, by the by the potential uh, audience. So we, you, we need a lot. Like just today, like the camera, we 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 just still are the same people. Like we we talk, like to talk about diversity, to like to talk about this. So it's not. Uh, it's still quite a way, uh, way away yet, right? Mm -hmm. That's just my thinking, and to me personally, this is very new. I this this I would just even ask him, Mary, what? How do you use your pronouns? She or she, she or her? And I was checking with my daughter, all about this and this. <laughs> just, I mean, this is the beginning of the learning curve, and uh, it's uh, it uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful opening uh, beginning. Mm -hmm. Rebecca. No, I, all I was going to say was I think it's um, just in, in terms of that idea of, you know, how, how to bring the work that is being produced, as you said, Diane, by, in, you know, independent companies and the people who are, um, you know, doing work that's either in content or form what we aren't seeing kind of on those main stages. And I know something that I find really challenging. I'll give an example. So I, I work with a um, drag queen who is a theater trained performer uh, who performs, writes solo theater shows, but performs them in drag as a, as a character. And um, we've had conversations with presenters uh, in different parts of the country, because this artist tours, um, where they've said, oh, I, my audience isn't my audience isn't ready for this and and my my response is kind of always you know 
I think of the presenter's role as someone who produces theater also, when I'm producing a piece, it's my job to think of how to get people in. And it's my job to think outside of the box with my outreach strategies and my communication strategies. Like it's my job to get excited about something, to get other people excited about it. So if you're the leader of a, of a theater company, you know, or an arts organization, I'm always confused when, when people seem to like push that piece of, of their responsibility to the side, because if, if you're building relationships with an audience, they know you, they trust you. And if you can come out and say, Hey, here's a really important piece. What difference does it make by Mary beam? And here's what excites me about it. And here's why I would love, you know, for you to come see it and then let's talk about it. Like, but I think, I mean, that does, requ it requires, it requires bravery and it requires people taking that on, right? <laughs> and being willing to, you know, maybe not sell tickets right away, but it's, it's when people, you know, go, oh, it's a long process. You know, I have to slowly get my audience there. And it's like, well, you actually just need to start, <laughs> like just start putting things in front of them that are, that are new you know, or that they aren't used to. And then, you know, over time, you'll, you'll bring more people back. But it's, yeah, I think I've certainly been in situations where a theater company has said, oh, that seems really risky. And I was like, okay, but there's all these things we can do to mitigate that risk if we just put the work in to do it. Um, so that's, yeah. I know you had your hand up, Neela. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like oh. I jumped in. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, you uh, you were next, and I didn't remember that. Um, well, I guess Cynthia, your comments made me think. Uh, not that I'm uh, saying something directly to to you or your comments, but um, it just made me think: is when when we see someone, uh, well, let's say someone we don't know, and we make in our minds a decision about what that person's gender is. But that is just, we, we are looking at their gender presentation, how they, how they dress, how they cut their hair, how they appear to us, but it's not their gender identity. How they present themselves may not be the same as what their internal gender identity is, but it is maybe what they feel safe, how they feel safe presenting themselves to the world. Does this make any sense to all of you? Definitely me, yeah. Yeah. I never thought of that, Neela, that the way someone dresses might just be what they feel safest. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's so obvious, but I never thought of it that way. Oh, we do. Yeah. Yeah. But I, 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 it's such a like a daily challenge. I mean, it's a constant challenge, isn't it? I mean, Mila, I, uh, I, I'm a visible minority racially and all that. But compared with you, I guess I. Uh, I don't have that much, that much compared with what you are going through almost daily, constantly, how you want to present yourself uh, and how, how is the image you, you think it's safe to present at this occasion vis-a-vis -vis what you really are inside. I mean, isn't that the constant navigation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my goodness. that's. It take up so much energy. Yes, well, I think a lot of, of BIPOC people or, or new Im immigrants, they, they have the same pr problems, the same navigations. Yes, this is true. This is true. But yeah, I'm just wondering, I compare. <laughs> because after all, I've been here 50 years. So I've been navigating all these years. So it's becoming less struggling, right? Mm -hmm. But still, mm -hmm. new new situation always new you still has to take you know take energy to see how better to navigate but from what you were saying uh it's yeah i think you put us so raw it's such a raw i feeling
Well, I, th I think one of the um, flashpoints for non-binary people and trans people in general is are the washrooms. And that can be um, a terribly unsafe place um, for trans and non-binary folks. So, I mean, that's why we've been spending so many years in trying to get our signs in a way that will be um, informative and welcoming. Um, so that's, that's um, it, it's, it's not such an issue for me personally because I, people look at me, they may be a little confused, but mostly they're going to land on, uh, she's, a, she's a woman if they're not into, the, um, they don't understand the non-binary. But there's other people who are, um, whose gender presentation is more ambiguous and, and um, yeah, it can be really hard for them. But I walked into a, a hospital washroom and I, I use female washrooms. I feel safer there. Um, or I prefer, of course, uh, uh, gender neutral washrooms. But um, I was walking into this hospital washroom. It was a woman's washroom. And there was um, a woman in front of me, somebody that I thought was a woman in front of me. And she turned around and looked at me. And she told me it was the woman's washroom. This is the woman's washroom. And I said, oh, I know. And I am which it was awkward of me to say that, but that's yeah. how it came out of my mouth at the moment. Um, and she would not go in because I was behind her. And she, so she stepped aside and I went in. Um, was she afraid? Like she was afraid? Yeah, you I think she was afraid. Yeah, I think I do think she was. I, I don't know. I mean, I can't speak for her, but yeah. I, but I did notice when I came when I came out and washed my hands that she was actually there. So she did go in, but I don't know how that, you know, how long it took her to go in. She was nervous and I didn't know quite what to do about it. I mean, to make her not nervous. <laughs> I was already nervous myself by that point. <laughs> I don't think it's your responsibility. True, but yeah, you want to make it the situation more at ease for everybody. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, she wasn't being mean or anything. She just was scared, I guess. Yeah. It's the discomfort that we encourage people to lean into with curiosity and bravery. And quite often, we're not ready to do that. It's hard. I don't understand quite what you mean, Lara. When we're faced with the unknown or something that is outside of our own normal experience, um, then we feel uncomfortable. And, and quite often that manifests as fear. And if we, if we approach that, it, it, instead, of, instead of seizing up and moving away from that, if we actually can move into it a little bit, and question, why am I feeling uncomfortable? Or ask the, ask the other person who might be in that situation, tell me more about your experience so I can learn about mine. And those are the areas for growth. Mm -hmm. as, long, as long as it's safe to do so then. Yeah, as long as it feels safe or if both parties can be brave enough to make room. But it's not always, it, it's not easy. It's just not easy. But perhaps that person left thinking, wow, that was a new experience for me. And I didn't react well to that. And I, I probably embarrassed or made that other person uncomfortable and that's not what I want to do. And so maybe I'm going to do things differently next time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's that place of being able to reflect back, but you, but you will never know. You will never know what they're experiencing or if they could grow from that or not. And, and so these are the opportunities we have to try to connect if we feel safe. 
Yeah, I, I wouldn't be leaning into some white supremacists. No, no, nor, nor would I want you to. No, this is the opportunity for the other person who felt that discomfort to question themselves about why. Why does this feel uncomfortable to me? Yeah, but I would be uncomfortable in front of white supremacists. Yeah. Or, or some people that were really transphobic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It is not your place to teach them. Not at all. No. It's for all of us when we do feel that discomfort, whether it's around transphobia or around racism or just any situation that is unfamiliar to us, that we feel our automatic response is fear, then question that. Am I really threatened here? What is, what is my discomfort about? Well, she probably thought she really was threatened. But why? <laughs> because she thought I was a man, I think. Following her into a, a, wash a woman's washing. Yeah. Uh, but she could have slammed the door in your face. Like you weren't following right on her heels, surely. I was pretty close behind her, but not. Well, hopefully you were six feet apart. <laughs> oh, no, this was this was a couple of years ago. Oh, it was pre-COVID. Oh, okay. Yeah, pre-COVID. Right. <clears throat> okay. If anybody gets too close, it's like, get away from me. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. Neil, I appreciate you sharing. Neil, I appreciate you sharing that because I think as Mary had said earlier, too, I don't think there's probably a non-binary or trans person or even an androgynous woman sometimes who hasn't been, you know, questioned or looked at the wrong way in the washroom. And it, it can be awkward, I think. Um, and uh, there's, no, there's no easy way through it. And um, like, like you said, you don't necessarily know if someone's safe to um, uh, talk to them or not. But um, I guess it depends too, you know, if we're in a group of people there's a different kind of opportunity to educate somebody to help help them be a little bit more move somewhere. I mean, I have seen white supremacists interviewed and what changed them were relationships, you know? And so, but what what is the context for when that's gonna be possible to do? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the setting? And it's certainly not alone heading into a washroom, but um, you know, classrooms, churches, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we've got to look for venues to do that for sure. Surprised people rarely behave at mm -hmm. their mm -hmm. Okay, is it time to wrap things up? I was just going to add in one thing about washrooms. <laughs> After our GSA having all these discussions about uh, the signage on our washrooms and and how they will be used. And I think there's probably going to be some learning opportunities <laughs> standing out there in the washrooms and in Hewitt Hall, just uh, um, to help us all learn and be more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe uh, what you experienced, Neela, in that washroom a couple of years ago, we, we will find ways to um, carry out conversations that keeping in mind that it is a learning curve we're all on here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and finding ways that just make things um, a lot more comfortable for everybody. Uh, the writer Ivan Coyote um, tells some great tales uh, about Washington, but about many, about life. But uh, they're a non-binary person and, and they, they're just a wonderful storyteller. Ivan Coyote. Yes, so we can recommend anybody who would like to learn more about this about being non-binary at least from one person's ex experience you can check out Ivan Coyote. Rebecca's put yeah. it in the chat. Oh, and Nancy did you want to add a question? Well I just want to add an appreciation Mary for bringing back some of the early days of COVID which I had actually forgotten <laughs> and it's a like it's a great archive of those yeah. early days apart from its many other gifts. So thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I wrote it in June and even then I had to go back and see what was happening in March. <laughs> and Leslie? Leslie? 
Um, thanks. I just wanted to say I've been reflecting on the subject of age since uh, we somebody brought it up initially. And I wanted to say that I agree. It's lovely seeing a play in which all the people are older, all the characters are older. But I think the best thing about being in my 70s is I'm much less concerned about how I appear to people. I feel much less, uh, I think oddly, I feel less vulnerable. Um, and I feel much less need to please people, which is so lovely and liberating. Uh, and I realized probably I was wrong saying that a happy ending would have involved Carmel changing because it's a lot to expect two women in their 70s. I don't know that Carmel was in her 70s, but two uh, older people to suddenly embrace change. It's wonderful that one person can do it. It's probably over the top to have a second person doing the same thing. So I take back my earlier comment about happy endings. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Cynthia? No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, it was, I don't know why the hand. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But I, okay. yeah, I, I, I really appreciate this because I was so, so wrapped up in the uh, anti racism. And then I'm just beginning to, 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 to open up to other area. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a fear. The fear is, so fundamentally damaging because just for instance i was trying i'm i'm just going to see my uh, my neighbor whom i never met before just talk on the phone and i realized um only afterwards uh, you know we talked and then she's from india and um and then we chat and this and then coming back on the other on my way home met another neighbor and i said about you know about this indian neighbor she right away said, oh, be careful, be careful. Mm -hmm. You know, the Indian, uh, the Indian uh, variant, you know, just, you know, uh -huh. just like mm -hmm. earlier, uh, I'm Chinese and the Chinese Wuhan uh, mm -hmm. virus. So, so it, it's, oh my goodness, it just never ends. You know, that's always something mm -hmm. going on, attach, oh, it's just never ends. So mm -hmm. it's the fear, you know, it's like a, Fear monger, monger almost mm -hmm. trying to trying to uh, make things scary. But it is rooted in in racism, right? Yeah, but it's fear too, right? It's anything unknown, just by uh, non-binary, it's on. Un it was unknown to me, and I I wouldn't know how I would have reacted when I was in 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 the line of the washroom uh, ahead of you. I, I I I I would know. Now I I think I'll, uh, I'll I I understand more. I'll be more calm. Maybe earlier. Oh my goodness, what do I do now? You know, it's the uh, this kind of instinct mm -hmm. with no with no information, with no knowledge, and then with the fear for the fear for kind of messages around, you know, that you hear from media or from whatever that drive you further, <laughs> that is so harmful. Mm. We all start somewhere yep. in our learning. I just wanted to make one more comment that I think the other thing about having characters that are older is, um, and that are still growing and changing is, I mean, that's the wonderful heartwarming thing. Mm. People don't stop growing and changing. And um, I remember when I was again doing, um, you know, education lessons in the school, I remember using an article and this had a happy ending, Leslie, and you'll be happy to know. And I can't remember which one of the couples in their 70s, one of them transitioned was transgender and they stayed together lovingly. It didn't, you know, it didn't matter that the one person had decided that they needed to transition at that time in their life. It was very heartwarming and definitely not, not threatening to the, you know, audience of young people because <laughs> it was an older character. <laughs> yeah, very good point. Okay, maybe before we tune off, I'll just tell you that Haven Theatre has another project that I'm involved in. And um, it does involve Neela as a trans character, but it's not the, 
that trans, her being trans is not a focus. It's just- They're being trans. They're being trans, thank you. They're being trans is not the Everybody's focus. Everybody's occasion to practice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they told me that they were very happy with playing their role <laughs> that I'm practicing. <laughs> What's the name of the play? I'm not, I'm not, it's a film. It's going to be a film. Huh? So this will be the first time I've done a film. Also a new experience huh. for Joel, right? Oh, Amazing. so cool. And um, when, when is it, when can we see it? Or, or what stage are you at right now? <laughs> Joel, do you want to answer yeah, that? Yeah, we're just uh, still in the uh, uh, rehearsal stage and uh, it's all very new for us. I've never been involved in, in film either. And uh, we are trying to keep it uh, isolated. So everyone's filming it on their own. So it's, uh, oh, it's quite okay. an experiment, uh, but hopefully it'll be, it'll be up for everyone to see. Um, we want to sort of uh, pass it around to maybe see if we can get into a festival or something, but then it'll, it'll premiere on Haven. Cool. Cool. Yeah, so it's a short film? Yeah. Short film. yeah. Okay. It's called Not on My Watch. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I love it. Okay, any final thoughts? Well, we were talking earlier, some of us, about the Hollaback bystander training, bystander intervention training. And that came, popped into my head again when Neela was talking about the washroom. Part of what I really appreciate about their trainings is they're only an hour long and they use a 5D approach. So I think for, for me and I think most people when they think about being brave enough to intervene as a bystander, you think about doing something very direct and kind of um, uh, engaging. But that's the final D. And the, the first one is to do something just to distract the situation. So you drop your purse on the ground in the washroom to kind of, you know, kind of give by some time. And then my second favorite is delay, where you don't say something immediately, but then you hang around and talk to the person um, mm. who was a kind of harassed or whatever afterwards. And almost immediately I took the training. I've had uh, like so many opportunities to do something like that, usually in quite minor situations. And then the other thing I really appreciate um, the way we were talking about, well, I wouldn't feel comfortable if I knew somebody was a transphobic or a white supremacist. They really encourage you to um, and give you some tools for uh, taking a risk assessment of the situation. Mm. And, um, and then, you know, so the distract and delay ones, I mean, for me are almost always safe for me and not going to have any much risk of escalating the situation, right? And so, so it's been quite interesting to even use it as almost a, a, a kind of a, a model, I guess, if I'm witnessing something that doesn't even have to be all that extreme, but I can kind of think, okay, I can, I, I might just uh, engage with this somehow, you yeah. So once we get those bathroom signs up and get people back at UCB, we might all have to do washroom bystander <laughs> intervention training. <laughs> and role play. We <laughs> will. Role plays we will. <laughs> this yeah. might be a great job for our youth. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sounds great. Yeah. So uh, I guess other people might thank you, but thank you all for coming. I've really enjoyed engaging with the cast again and the crew and uh, thank you Mary Beam as always look forward to your next project Joel yeah. Yeah, thank you everybody it's been a wonderful thank you very thank much thank you everybody fantastic thank you Maya yeah. I'm really happy to have been here yes and thanks for the all the Toronto or Ontario people because it's very late there <laughs> yes it's been so nice to have you here cast crew director owner theater manager whatever all of you thank you and thank you all nice to see all fellow unitarians too <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.